Oasis of Hope. It's good to be here this morning. We are uh, we are singing this morning. We we believe the Lord wants us to worship the Lord with our voices today. So I hope to let you know we are singing this morning. And also, I uh, want to just thank you for coming, those of you who were able to come here today, and uh, also for those of you online. And we we ask God's blessing on you as you listen to the and worship with us and uh, listen to the Word this morning. So we're going to start off, and uh, uh, Ponzi's going to come and, and do the, no, we're going to do this song first, and then 469, Revive Us Again, and then Ponzi's going to come and uh, lead us in prayer and read the scriptures to us. Revive Us Again, 469. church and the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hi Janice. Hi. It's good to be here guys. You know we've been we've been watching service online and we opened up the our service a couple weeks ago and it's awesome to be here. I know some of you are online, Pete and Carol, Red Susan and and all the gang here and it's beautiful to be here with you guys. So let's uh let's turn to Psalms chapter five. We're going to read God's word today, and like we do here at church, um, we usually stand up. So will you all stand up for, for to honor the Lord for his word? I'll be reading out of the uh, New Living Translation, and this is Psalms chapter 5. O oh Lord, hear me as I pray. Pay attention to my groaning. Listen to my cry for help, my King and my God. For I pray to no one but you. Listen to my voice in the morning. Each morning, I bring my request to you and wait expectantly. O oh God, you take no pleasure in wickedness. You cannot tolerate the sins of the wicked. Therefore, the proud may not stand in your presence, for you hate 
all who do evil. You will destroy those who tell lies. The Lord detests murderers and deceivers. Because of your unfailing love, I can enter your house. I will worship at your temple with deepest awe. Lead me in the right path, O Lord, or my enemies will conquer me. Make your way plain for me to follow. My enemies cannot speak a truthful word. Their deepest desire is to destroy others. Their talk is foul, like the stench from an open grave. Their tongues are filled with flattery. O oh God, declare them guilty. Let them be caught in their own traps. Drive them away because of their many sins, for they have rebelled against you. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them sing joyfully praises forever. Spread your protection over them, that all who love your name may be filled with joy. For you bless the godly, O Lord. You surround them with your shield of love. Praise God. Amen. You know, we... This is such an interesting passage. Here's something about God that we rarely ever talk about. And the scriptures tells us that the Lord hates wickedness. And that's the bad news, you know. We were all there at one point. And the bad news is that the Lord did not love us. But praise God for his tender mercy and his love. That, you know, today we are called his children. Amen. And, it, you know, I, I wanted to go over uh, verse 11. Let all... Who take refuge rejoice. We take refuge in the Lord. But look at the next, the next part of that. Let them sing joyful praises forever. And that's what we're here to do. We're here to praise the Lord. Amen. Let me pray. Dear Holy Father, we thank you so much for this day, Lord. We honor you, Lord. Not only with our voices, Lord, but with our conduct. And dear Father, as we uh, lift up our voice and praise to you today, may it be, Lord, uh, a sweet stone that rumble to you, Father. We're so grateful, Lord, that we can gather together and see our fellow brethren. And we also thank you, Lord, for this technology that those that are online can also be with us, Father. And we welcome your presence when there is two or three gathered together in your holy name. There you are in the midst. So, Father, we honor your name. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Ponzi, thank you for reading that. And uh, that's a perfect chapter for today, isn't it? Yes. So we're going to turn over to our hymnals, hymn number 329. 329, Grace, Greater Than Our Sin. Good morning. I want to say good morning to my wife. I haven't seen her yet. <laughs> in the other car. So. <laughs> Marvelous grace of
so thankful for you. Amen. I'm so thankful for that. He's so good to us. An undeserved love, huh? An undeserved favor. And yet, also with that undeserved love and favor comes an undeserved ability to live for Him. Amen. Blessed assurance. Three thirty-four. Three thirty-four in the hymnal. Blessed assurance. The key of D. Three three four. Blessed assurance.
watching over us. We thank you, Lord, that you have great things ahead for us. Give you praise. Amen. Good morning, Oasis Hope Church of Riverbend, California. Good morning, Rick. Yeah. I am not Jesse Haney, if you were looking for him. Sorry. You got a substitute this week. I'm honored to bring the Word of God to you this morning in the absence of our pastor and his wife, who are taking some well-deserved time away, and uh, hopefully they're refueling and refreshing, and they'll be back with us next week. Uh, let me start this morning with a word of prayer. Uh, as we get into our message this morning. Father, thank you uh, for this day and this day to praise you, worship you, honor you, this day to fellowship with our fellow congregants, and uh, we greet those who are online streaming with us as well. And Father, we, uh, we thank you for this time to open your word. And as I often say when I preach, Lord, take the preacher out of the way. Let your Holy Spirit have his way with us today. And so, Father, that's what we're asking. Work in us, work in our hearts, work in our minds, Lord. And help us come away different than we came in this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of my message this morning is, Do We Believe in the Power of God? And I want to challenge you this morning in, in what you truly believe. If I were to ask you that question, do you believe in the power of God? I'm sure all of you would say, of course I believe in the power of God. Right? And I would expect no less of a response from every one of you. But do you? Do I? Do we? Do we really believe in the power of God? Or maybe better put, do we act like we believe in the power of God? That's what it comes down to. It comes down to our conduct. Sometimes this world that we live in can be so distracting that we say one thing, but we tend to act differently, right? <coughs> and we're going to explore this question this morning and maybe expose some areas in our lives where that question is a legitimate question to ask ourselves. This morning we're going to discover what the power of God is and if you truly believe in it, not just some of the time, but all of the time. When you get to know me better, you'll discover that I love studying and digging into God's Word and especially doing word studies because I believe when you really understand what words mean, it just opens up the Word of God. In the English, we have one word for power. That's power, right? <laughs> That's the word we use. When it comes to the Greek, though, there's four different words they use to convey something that's all surpassing and of the character of God. The first one is dunamis. Dunamis is the general word for power. Strength, might, power. That's dunamis. Energesia means power in action or working power. Kratos means the strength exercised in the activity or dominion or overpowering majesty. And ishkas means inherent ability, whether exercised or not, strength possessed. All of those definitions apply to our God. Number one, his general power. Number two, his power in action. Number three, his dominion over everything. And number four, his inherent ability to display his power however he sees fit. That's our God, right? Christian Living 101, in essence, says this. Our life is knowing God the Father through God the Son, Jesus Christ, in the power of God the Holy Spirit. And that should cause the effort and effect of our life to glorify God. Right? That's what we're all here to do. Glorify God. Right? 
The essence of our life is knowing God and living in his power. The word essence can be defined as the most important ingredient, the crucial element, right? It can be argued that the most important ingredient of quality fudge is a good cream, right? <laughs> the most important ingredient of quality bread is good wheat. The most important ingredient of quality candy is good sugar, right? The most important ingredient or the essence of Christian living is Jesus Christ, period. A relationship with God through Jesus Christ and living in the power of that relationship. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. I'm going to use several texts of scripture this morning to teach us. So let's go through all these scriptures now. These scriptures give us all of those definitions of power from the Greek that I mentioned earlier. Ephesians 6.10, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his great power. 2 Timothy 1.7, for God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. 2 Thessalonians 1.11, to this end we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of of faith by his power. Ephesians 3.16, I ask the Father in his great glory to give you the power to be strong inwardly through his spirit. I pray that Christ will live in your hearts by faith. Ephesians 3.20-21, with God's power working in us, God can do much, much more than anything we can ask or imagine. And 2 Peter 1.3, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. Does the word of God speak about power and the power of God? Did you see that? I just picked a handful of verses I could have read to you. We could go on and on and on. And I believe one of the things God calls us to as his children is to live in his power. I'm going to use many examples this morning. Noah, Job, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, Deborah, Gideon, Ruth, Samuel, Samson, Saul, David, Solomon, Elijah, Elisha, Jonah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, Mary, Joseph, John the Baptist, Peter, James, John, Paul, and Jesus himself. And we're going to go through every one of those this morning, so I hope you don't have plans for lunch. Okay, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But I wanted to give you just a list, and I probably left some out, of the people who lived in the power of God. And we have the great stories of Scripture to prove that. And we will go through a few of those examples. I won't go through all 30 of them for you, okay? That would take a little bit of time. We uh, obviously know all those stories. Um, and we know how God has demonstrated his power. And the question I want to ask ourselves this morning is, do we believe in God's power in our lives and do we claim it for ourselves? As we read through those six New Testament verses, Paul and Peter's message is very clear to us. We should be living in and through the power of God in our lives. But when the rubber meets the road, when the deepest trials come into our lives, when we have the option to do something or maybe just stop and pray, which do we choose to do? Psalm 68, 35 says, awesome is God from his sanctuary. The God of Israel, he is the one who gives power and strength to his people. Blessed be God. And he only gives it to us if we ask for it. He only gives it to us if we ask for it and we trust him for it. Do we believe in God's power or do we believe in our own abilities to solve our problems, to handle a situation? In our culture, at every point, we are tempted to trust in our own power, aren't we? And we're encouraged by the world to live in our own power and ability. 
we're always told to take care of number one, right? That's what the world teaches us, to believe in our own power, to take care of ourself. That's what we're always forced to fight against. So the question for us is, are we willing to live in such a way that we are radically dependent on and desperate for the power that only God can provide? It comes down to trusting in the power of God rather than relying on our own abilities. It reminds me of a story that I once heard. There once was a little boy playing in a sandbox. He was digging and digging and digging and suddenly he discovered a huge rock in the middle of the sand. He dug till he loosened the stone. Once loosened, he pushed and shoved, even using his feet to the edge of the sandbox. And that's where the problem began because the more he pushed that stone, the more it rolled back into the sand. His dad was watching from a window and he noticed the little boy and he noticed how frustrated he got and he began to cry. And his father came to the sandbox and he asked, why didn't you use all of your power to remove the stone? And the boy replied, I did. I pushed with all my might, with my hands and my feet, only to fail. No, son, his father answered, you didn't call for me. With that said, the father moved the rock outside the sandbox. Aren't we the same way with God? How often do we use our own power, our own abilities, our own talents only to fail? For whatever reason, we tend to miss God in the everyday scheme of life. If the little boy in the story had only realized his father's power, I think he knew he could ask his God for help. I'm sure he knew his father was there. I just think he forgot the father's power and the ability to remove the rock. How many times are we like that with God? How many times do we forget the power that God has for all of us, even in himself, to remove the rocks in our lives? When Jonah was languishing in the belly of the whale, this is what he prayed in Jonah 2.7. When my life had almost gone, I remembered the Lord. I prayed to you, and you heard my prayers in your holy temple. Great reminder for us, right? When I tried everything else, oh, then I remembered the Lord. Then I prayed. Then he heard. Then he answered. We're too guilty of that, aren't we? We need to never let the situation get as bad as the situation got for Jonah before we remember God. If we will but remember the Father and trust him to have the power to remove the rocks or to strengthen us to remove them ourselves, we would be in a much better place. We're too much like the little boy. We want to handle it ourselves. This just almost never works. But we're humans, and we're frail, and we fail constantly. Our culture tells us that we can do anything we set our minds to, right? You've heard that one before. There's no limit to what we can do when we combine our ingenuity, our imagination, our innovation, our skill, and our hard work. We can earn any degree. We can start any business. We can climb any ladder. We can attain any prize. We can achieve any goal. We can even grow any church. And then we can be celebrated for being so great at achieving all of those things. We walk away with this sense of our greatness and it, they, our assets and, and, and our own ability. And aren't those the people in our culture today who get all the recognition? That self-made man or that self-made woman, right, gets all the recognition. But scripture has a different message for us. Scripture calls for us to die to ourselves, to believe in God to trust in his power and not our own abilities. The gospel confronts us with our utter inability 
to accomplish anything of value apart from him. The gospel confronts us with whether we have the ability to provide our own salvation, which we don't. And no matter how many stones we may move out of the way, we are going to fall short. But God removed that stone, didn't he? By sending his son, Jesus Christ. The gospel says, just believe and you will be saved. God removed all the stones that we can live with him forever in heaven. Isaiah 40, verses 28 through 31. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That is someone walking in the power of God. In his book, Radical, which I recommend all of you pick up and read, the author, David Platt, recounts a story of a time he was at a graduation ceremony in Indonesia. By the way, one of the requirements to graduate from that seminary in Indonesia was that you had had to have planted a church and had at least 30 baptized believers from that Muslim community in your church for you to be able to graduate from that seminary. Woo. Every graduate did this. One of the graduates named Raiden gave his testimony. Raiden had grown up and was a trained ninja. <laughs> right? He knew jujitsu and a number of other ways to take someone out. And Raiden was sharing with a family in an unreached community when the local witch doctor showed up at the home. And for those of you who don't know, very many places in this world, witch doctors still have quite uh, uh, pr prominence in those communities. Through their incantations and their curses, they are able to control people. So this witch doctor shows up and calls Raiden out. He wanted to fight him. And Raiden's first initial reaction was, I'm going to go and take this dude out, right? He's a trained ninja. But then God spoke to Raiden. And he said, you don't need to fight anymore. I will fight for you. So Raiden grabbed a chair. He went outside. He sat down. And he told the witch doctor, I don't need to do any fighting anymore. My God's going to fight for me. Then Raiden recounted what happened next. As the witch doctor tried to speak, he began to gasp for air. He was choking. He couldn't breathe. People came running to see what was happening. The witch doctor kneeled over and died. Raiden said he didn't know what to do. He had never seen anything like this before in his life. And then God spoke to him. He said, Raiden, since you have the whole town gathered around, why don't you preach the gospel? And that's what he did. And many people came to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior for the first time. Amen. Isn't that a great testimony? Great Raiden believed in the power of God. And in Raiden's inability, God glorified himself. If we do it in our own ability, we will attribute it to our own glory. If we do it in God's power, then God gets all the glory. Is that not the goal for every one of us as believers to bring God glory? God actually delights in exalting our inability. God calls us to give up everything. As God's children, we should not make much of ourselves, but we should make much of God. There are so many examples in Scripture where people put in situations where they come face to face with their utter need for the power of God. 
where they have no choice but to make much of God and not of themselves. I like one of the classic examples in John 3 where the people come to John and complain that more people are now going over to where Jesus' disciples are and being baptized. And John has one response to this. He says, he must increase and I must decrease. Let me give you a few other examples from the list of characters I gave you earlier. And no, I won't go through all 30 of them. But I'll give you a few of them. Let's start with Moses. We all know the story of Moses. Under the fear of having her son killed, Moses' mom placed him in a basket along the banks of the Nile. Moses' daughter finds him and makes him her own. He grows up in luxury and forsakes it all when God spoke to him from a burning bush and called him to lead his people out of Egypt to the promised land. And Moses follows his orders and does everything God asked him to do, including leading Israel safely through the ten plagues and then out into the wilderness. They go out to the wilderness headed toward the promised land, but there's one major obstacle in the way. It's called the Red Sea. And if you were Moses and God led you out of Egypt and had you camp in front of the Red Sea, and you look up in the distance and you see the dust from the Egyptians who are now coming to pursue you, what would you do? One of my first reactions might be to question God. God, why would you bring us here? We're going to die here. But Moses was a man who believed in the power of God. Listen to what he tells the Israelites. For Moses said to the people, fear not. Stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians who you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. Wow. And as we know, God splits the Red Sea. The Israelites pass through. The Egyptians pursue. And when they get in the middle of the Red Sea, the water comes back down and wipes them all out. And who got all the glory for that? God. God did. And God even prophesied it back in Exodus 14.4. He said, I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts. And the Egyptians shall never kn shall know that I am the Lord. Do you think when nobody came back from that battle that the Egyptians got the idea that God was Lord? <laughs> I bet they did. I bet they did. Notice that Moses said to the Israelites, see the salvation of the Lord. We need that every day, don't we? We need to see the salvation of the Lord in our lives from this culture we live in, right? Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For those of you questioning if you've ever experienced the power of God in your life, I am here to tell you that if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have experienced the power of God. The scripture says salvation is the power of God. You've experienced the power of God. The same is true as you ever led anyone to Christ in your life. If you have, you have experienced the power of God. I don't know about all of you, but that makes me feel good. I've had the opportunity to lead several people to Christ. I've experienced the power of God. I didn't lead him to Christ. The power of God did. His Holy Spirit did. And not only is salvation a demonstration of the power of God, but the author of our salvation, Jesus Christ, is identified as the power of God. 1 Corinthians 1, 23-24. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called both Jews and Greek, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. 
Jesus Christ is the power of God. Your Savior, the one who walks with you every day, is the power of God. So you have to stay connected. Don't let sin ruin the relationship. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. He makes us righteous over and over again so that we can stay in that relationship of power. Jesus demonstrated that he was the power of God as he lived here on earth. Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. The Holy Spirit and power. He is the power of God. He lives within you. You have the power of God. Next, let's look at Joshua. At the end of Joshua chapter 5, we find Joshua alone wondering about the battle that lies ahead. His army is positioned, but they have one obstacle, a massive wall around the city, a wall that was six feet thick by 26 feet tall, and a ditch around the whole city that was 27 feet wide. Joshua has an encounter with the man in charge of the Lord's army. And he listens to the game plan, and because he believed in the power of God, he follows the plan. The army marches around the city once each day, blowing trumpets for six days. Then on the seventh day, they march around the city seven times. Let me read you from Joshua 6, 16, what happens. And at the seventh time, when the priest had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. So the people shouted, and the trumpets were blown. As soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted a great shout, and the wall fell down flat, so that the people went into the city, every man straight before him, and they captured the city. Archaeological discoveries have shown that the wall fell in such a way that it filled in that 27-foot pit, so that the armies could march straight in and take the city. And who receives the glory for this event? God. Let me give you one more. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Along with Daniel, they were exiled to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. They immediately became vegetarians. They turned out to look better than all the other young men in the kingdom. And not only that, but they exceeded everyone else in wisdom and knowledge and understanding. And one day Nebuchadnezzar makes a golden image and orders everyone to worship it. Of course, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to worship a false god. And they were brought before the king. And the punishment for their crime against the king of Babylon was a fiery furnace. But these men also believed in the power of God. Listen to what they tell the king in Daniel 3.16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Wow, I bet that expedited their execution, right? How dare you talk to the king like that? Of course, you know the story. They're thrown in the fiery furnace, a furnace so hot that it killed the men who threw them in. And then as they look in the flames, there's four men in the flames. And we know that the fourth man was an incarnate Christ protecting these men. 
And it's interesting, when they took them out of the flames, they did not even smell like smoke. Talk about a miracle. Talk about God's power. And who gets all the glory for this event? God. So we've seen three examples of men who demonstrated that they did trust in the power of God. Notice there was no hesitation in exercising their faith with any of them. Notice they got the word of God and immediately acted upon it. So how do you and how do I respond when obstacles and challenges come into our lives? Do we question rather than act? Do we jump into it rather than wait upon the Lord? Do we rely on our own abilities rather than trust in the power of God? Do we think that we have something, anything, rather than stopping and praying? I'm guilty of doing all of the wrong things at various times in my life. Do I believe in the power of God? Of course I do. Do I act like I believe in the power of God all of the time? No. Sometimes I fail. Sometimes I fail. Does my life characterize that I believe in the power of God? In the Truth Project series, which I've had the honor of leading through maybe eight or nine times now, Dr. Del Tackett asked this question in a different way. And I love this question. Do you really believe that what you believe is real? Do you really believe that what you believe is real? Do you really believe all those stories that you read in this Bible? Are they really real? And that the power of God does exist? And that it's there for you too? That God can do unbelievable things in your life if you'll just trust in him and believe in him and believe that he will empower you. I have seen this so many times in my own life. God stepping in when I'm teaching like today. God stepping in when I'm evangelizing. God stepping in when I'm serving. God stepping in when I need his provision in my life. I can go on and on and on. I've seen the power of God in my life. And I believe it. How about you? When we look at the book of Acts, we see a very different picture there. We see such different images than what are present in our churches today. We see 11 timid guys huddled together in a small upper room. They know they need God's power. They are simple Galileans, men on the lower rung of the Jewish culture, disrespected by the higher classes in Jerusalem. These 11 are the group on which the spread of the gospel, the spread of Christianity rests. So what are they doing? Are they up there plotting their own strategies of how they're going to accomplish this monumental feat? No. We find them constantly joined together in prayer. They're not busy putting faith in themselves or relying on themselves. They are pleading for the power of God. They are confident that they will not accomplish anything without God's power and his provision. And then God sends his spirit on them. And Peter goes out and preaches the gospel with such power that more than 3,000 people are saved. They did the right thing. They waited. They prayed. They waited for the power of God to come upon them. And who gets all the glory? God. Colossians 1.11 being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience and joy. I think we would all agree that God has spoken to us this morning about his power and has done it so clearly. Further, that 
which he has spoken perfectly reflects his divine character and nature and leads us towards lives that are for our good and his glory. The question is not whether or not God's word is clear and reliable, but whether or not we trust God's word and his goodness and his power and walking in obedience to him. Ed Welch wrote a book entitled, When People Are Big and God Is Small. Welch's book deals with our tendencies to fear man rather than God, making man appear bigger than God. We could just as easily write our own book, however, every time we fail to trust and obey God, when I am big and God is small. Anytime we fail to trust God and obey his word, we are setting ourselves up as superior to him, claiming we know more and that our way is better than his. Before Adam and Eve ate the fruit in the garden, they had already sinned against God in their hearts. They failed to trust God, his word, and his goodness, causing them to act on their own wisdom and desires, leading to disobedience and death. We do the same when we fail to trust God, who speaks, and when we fail to obey that which he has spoken. We act as though we are big and God is small. We make much of ourselves and little of God. Christianity and following God has always been a matter of the heart. What caused David to kill Goliath? God's power working through a willing heart. A willing heart. What caused Peter to walk on the water? A heart of trust in the power of Jesus. What caused the disciples to preach even when told not to? Hearts that loved Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit that filled them up. Even the crucifixion of Jesus was a matter of the heart. If you think for one moment that the Romans crucified Jesus, you're wrong. Jesus says, no man takes my life. I lay it down willingly. It was the Savior's full heart of love and trust in his Father that crucified Jesus. Jesus was able to give thanks to God, not for what was about to happen to him, but because he believed in God's power to raise him from the dead and be glorified through him. Through God's power, as we have already seen, comes salvation and eternal joy and peace to those who love him. Through his power comes forgiveness to make righteous millions of sinners. Let me give you one more contemporary example of someone who believed in the power of God. Lottie Moon. Lottie Moon, who lived from 1840 to 1912, was prepared by God to impact both the Chinese people and the Southern Baptist Convention. She spent nearly 40 years living and working in China as a teacher and evangelist. She laid a foundation for solid support for missions among Southern Baptists. The first ever Christmas offering she undertook had a goal of $2,000. It collected $3,315.26. Today, it's one of the biggest offerings in the Southern Baptist Convention. Last year's Southern Baptist uh, Convention gave $133,886,000. Why? It's a direct result of God preparing one woman to reach a nation and a denomination through his power. The annual Lottie Moon Christmas offering for international missions has raised a total of $1.5 billion for missions ever since 1888. And it finances half of the entire Southern Baptist missions budget every year. Before I finish, let me give us three ways that sometimes we tend to doubt the power of God. Three ways we tend to trust in ourselves and fail to trust in God's power. One is we fail to trust God by questioning his word. Though Adam and Eve did not need help to question God's word, they had help in Satan, the father of lies. 
he introduced doubt into their minds by saying, did God really say? And we know that Satan is the real enemy and he is alive today. And he will seek to introduce doubt in our minds as well regarding God's word if we let him. God has spoken. He did not stutter. Furthermore, God's revelation is sufficient. He has given us all we need to know. He has told us all about love, honor, worship, and how to obey him. The question is, will we trust God by trusting in the power of his word? Or will we question God's word? Especially with all the distractions in our culture today. Is it a sin to have questions when we read the word of God? Certainly not. We will never fully understand all the depths of the riches of his great revelation. The question is, first, do we read God's word showing its authority over us and our submission to it? If we do, then how do we respond when we have a question? The way we should respond is we should fully accept his word as truth, even if we don't fully understand it. We should question our understanding of God's word, not the word itself. You should keep God's word as your trustworthy authority. You shall never question God's word by making yourself an authority over his word. God's word is his power. Secondly, we fail to trust God by altering his word. The word of God in its quality and quantity of content is perfect true and trustworthy as is God himself nothing in the word of God needs to be removed and nothing needs to be added to it when we alter the word of God by addition as Eve did in Genesis or as the Mormons do in the book of Mormon or by subtracting as the revisionist history people do we are demonstrating a lack of trust in God we either say that God's word is not sufficient because something needs to be added or his word is not good because it places demands on me that are not necessary. Either way, altering the word of God shows that we do not trust the wisdom or goodness of the God of the word. What is our tendency? Do we add things to God's word? Maybe social restrictions. The church did this for years. Things like smoking and music and dress and drinking and movies we added to the word of God or do we take things away from God's word maybe because of a hatred for divorce since our spouse was unfaithful to us or the command to forgive because somebody has hurt us deeply and we don't want to forgive do we take away from the word of God how does your willingness to alter the word of God show that you are not trusting or submitting to the word of God. And the third thing is, do we fail to trust God by disobeying his word? The clearest evidence of our failure to trust God is our disobedience to his word. Disobedience is our adamant usurping of God's authority and reign in our lives. Our disobedience says, I know what your word says, but I'm going to do what I want to do instead. This is the fruit of our decision to make ourselves big and God small. To make much about ourselves and not much about God. When faced with an opportunity to obey or disobey God's word, the question to ask is not, does this thing appear to be helpful, beautiful, or desirable? The question to ask is, what has God said about this? Obedience will flow out of our trust and surrender. Disobedience comes from a heart of doubt and rebellion. We have all had occasions to not obey God's word. And the results from doubting God's word and choosing to rebel against him usually are not good. Would you agree? At the very least, they break our relationship with him. When faced with some temptation to doubt and disobey don't be deceived by asking if the thing 
that you want seems to be helpful, beautiful, or desirable. Instead, simply ask yourself, what has God said? Then trust God's goodness and faithfulness and walk ahead in obedience to him. And we can also help each other. Hebrews 10, 24 through 26 says, And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. I need your encouragement, and you need mine. I need your encouragement to walk in the power of God, and you need mine. We can stimulate one another to obedience and believing in the power of God. We have to continue to gather and encourage one another. From the time Adam and Eve first sinned, we have been bent towards distrusting God, his word, and his goodness, choosing instead to disobey God and go our own way. That's the falling sin nature in us, right? It's our normal bent if we don't stay in the power of God. If we don't walk in the Spirit. Whether we add or subtract from God's word, we demonstrate our lack of trust in God and his word and his character. We place ourselves above God and his word, making ourselves big and God small. Those who do not know Christ walk in this way as their manner of life. The only hope is repentance of sin and surrender to Christ as Savior and Lord. Believers must also realize, however, our similar sins of disobedience. We must depend on the transforming power of God and the sanctifying work of God's Spirit to empower us to trust Him, to submit to His Word, and to walk in obedience by His grace and for His glory. I know I strayed a little by talking about the importance of the Word of God, but this is the power of God. And we need to be in this all the time. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. That is the Word of God. Conclusion, what do you think the little boy we talked about at the beginning thought after his father picked up the rock and removed it? Wow, how strong he is. Wow, that strength is mine anytime I want it. Wow, I can trust my dad to do anything for me. Wow, God, you're that same type of father. How strong you are. That strength is mine whenever I want it. I can trust my Father to do anything for me. When we realize all that God can do for us, we too can say what Paul said in Ephesians 3, 21, 20 and 21. With God's power working in us, God can do much, much more than anything we can ask or imagine. And Jesus said it best, right? In Matthew 19, 26, Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. If we continue to trust in our own power, life is bound to be difficult, but if we can learn to trust in the power of God, as we have been discussing this morning, then things become so much easier and gets who gets all the glory? God. Don't forget this. Don't let anyone ever take this away from you. You have the power of God. You are a child of God. When he saved you, he demonstrated his power in you. You have Jesus Christ living in your heart. Jesus is defined as the power of God. You have his word. This is defined as the power of God. Don't let anyone ever take away from you that you possess the power of God.
Now, Steve, you can come up. Go and utilize it. Go and utilize that power and do great things for God and for his kingdom. sing a song out of Psalm 95 if you have your uh, Bible it would probably be a New King James version or King James would would actually uh, give you the ex probably the, the closest to the exact words and it's uh, come let us worship and bow down Psalm 95 verses 6 and 7 I'll give you a minute Stand with me as we, as we sing this last song and worship the Lord together. And let that word sink into our, our hearts. Amen. Amen. Come let us worship and bow down. shepherd whose voice they know is the one who protects them, feeds them, guides them, 
sustains them. Lord, we thank you for your love as a shepherd for us. We'll give you thanks and praise today. And all the people said amen. Amen.